Hello everyone, uh, this is Klaus Arunia, at the University of Tsukuba for the Experiment Designs for Computer Sciences, Topic 8, Video 3, uh, Multiple Comparison, ANOVA, and post hoc Testing. So in the last video, we described the statistical model for ANOVA that is used when you want to compare a set of samples. The idea is that by observing the difference between the mean standard error, which is the error of the entire set of samples considers a single sample against the effect set, that means uh, <clears throat> against the effect error. In other words, the F error of each sample independently, we could calculate the F statistic and the F statistic would tell us if any one of the uh, sample, any one of the uh, samples, any one of the effects would move one of the samples away from the <clears throat> from the grade mean. In other words, the ANOVA tests a new hypothesis where every uh, effect uh, has zero effect on the sample mean against an alternate hypothesis where at least one of the effects changes the sample means. But the question is, even if we reject the new hypothesis, we still have the question, which of the effects is the one that is producing the effect? Okay, so for, for us to take this question, we need to answer two questions. First is, can we verify the assumptions of the test? And the second is, which means are different from which and by how much? So let's go for the assumptions, okay? So as we mentioned before, the ANOVA model is based on three assumptions on the behavior of the residuals. The first assumption is independence. In other words, uh, the residuals, they do not depend on each other for the values. They are all the, the, the errors of the observations. They are drawn from a normal distribution with independent, um, independent sample. The second and maybe the most important is almost this, this, this it. difficult word. Uh, so, but it means the equality of variances across groups. The variances don't we need to be exactly the same uh, on the samples, but they need to be similar enough that we can say that all of them came from the same population. Finally, we have uh, the normality assumption that we talked a lot about before. So uh, we can observe, obtain the error. So all these three assumptions, they are assumptions on the residuals. So we want to do our assumption testing on the residuals. And the residual EIJ is calculated as YIJ, so the observation value, minus the, uh, obs the estimated mean of all the observations. So it's YIJ minus the global, uh, the observed, the calculated mean, plus the calculated average of the values. So it's YIJ minus YI. So basically the, uh, <clears throat> The residual is calculated by separating the observation from the mean of the sample that observation came from. So these are our residuals, okay? It's not the observation minus the global mean, it's the observation minus the mean of that sample. Of course, if the new hypothesis is actually true, these two things are the same thing, but if the new hypothesis is not true, uh, the calculation will be different. So we want to use the second calculation. Uh, observation, minus mean of each sample. So uh, the normality assumption can be tested uh, using methods that we've seen already, like the Shapiro Wick test or observing a normal culture plot. Okay, the ANOVA is relatively robust on violations of normality as long as the other assumptions are verified. Okay, so let's look at homeostasticity. So homeostasticity means similar variances. So the homeostasticity assumption, you can test it using the Flynn-Kilden test. And we can also uh, visually test it by plotting the residuals. And we saw how to calculate the residuals before. So these are the residuals for our experiment. And we can see that in general, they seem to be equally distributed. Okay. Um, also, even if they're not exactly the same, the ANOVA is relatively robust to modest violations of homocedasticity as long as the sample is balanced. 
And we're going to talk a little bit about unbalanced samples. We might talk more about unbalanced samples next class because unbalanced here means that the sample sizes are the same. As for the independence assumption, as we said before, the independence assumption should be guaranteed by on the design phase. So it's very hard to test for independence. Uh, we can test some trivial examples like, okay, let's see if there is a time dependence by checking if the samples are autocorrelated. But the test for time dependence, the test for autocorrelation can be broken by simply mixing the samples. So if there is a dependence, there, if there is some sort of dependence between the observations that is not related to time, that can break the test. So you need to be careful about that. Okay, ways to do that is to make sure that you avoid pseudo replication and pseudo replication. We talk a little bit about it on the <coughs> paired uh, test. Pseudo replication is, for example, let's say that we have um, different types of woods A, B, C, D, but by a mistake, uh, C and D are the same type of woods. So now we have some pseudo replication here. Okay, so we have to try to stop that kind of stuff. Uh, to test for serial correlations, we can use the Dudley-Wilson test, as mentioned before. Um, and the ANOVA is quite sensitive to violations of independence. Okay, so we need to be very careful about uh, the, the observation, the violation of independence when we're doing an ANOVA test. Okay, so let's say that we passed all the assumptions, we cleared the assumptions. So now we need to determine which levels of the factor are uh, dif significantly dif different? Okay, of course, uh, it, this is if we reject the new hypothesis. If we did not reject the new hypothesis, then we assume that all the values are, uh, are, are not significantly different, and they might probably come from the same, um, the same, the same population. In that case, uh, there is a paper here that you can take a look to see how do you deal when uh, results are not significant. So of course, you don't, don't just throw away, you have to report them. The reporting is a little bit different, but it's still important to report uh, non-significant, statistically significant results. So um, there are different ways to determine uh, which levels of the factor are different. Uh, but one thing that is very important to mention is that you should choose one of these ways before you do the test, okay? So when you do your experiment design, you say, okay, we're going to do an ANOVA, and after the ANOVA, we're going to do we're going to do an all versus all comparison, or we're going to do a one versus all comparison. We're going to do a best versus all comparison. We're going to do a standard versus all comparison. It's important to make this the definition before you do the exam, the the test, because if you don't do that, you can do something like, okay, let's try one did not give a, the result that we want. Let's try another, did not give the result that we want. Did not, just, did, let's try another, did not give. Oh, this one actually gives a result. Let's write a paper about this. This is a very, this is called harking. So hypothet hypothetizing after the results are known. And this is a very easy way. This is a very common entry point for research, which is researcher bias. Uh, there were some very hor some horror stories about that. I don't have them right now, but I'll see if I add them to maybe the discussion uh, lecture. Okay, so let's try to define before we do the test which test we we, we need in advance. So um, the planning of multiple comparisons must be guided by the technical question. So depending on what kind of question you try to answer, uh, you want to use different ways. Uh, to calculate that, okay? So whenever possible, we should try to do the smallest number of comparisons that we need. Uh, the less comparisons that we do, uh, the better, uh, the, the more reliable our results are, okay? This is also use smaller sample size and also give us the largest power for the same experimental setup. So uh, the questions that we usually have is, how does one level compare to others? Um, how does each level compares against the grant mean? So we can see like each of the levels is statistically different from the grant mean, uh, which of the levels is different from the others, or which of the levels is different against a standard level. 
so the multiple comparisons uh, in ANOVA, when we do these multiple comparisons, here we're going to actually do a series of the tests, which is kind of different from what I talked at the beginning. But the idea here is that we are coming into these two tests with our eyes open. We already did an ANOVA, so that guarantees to us that at least one of the levels is different. And we're going to perform a, a compensation on the p-value to avoid the compounding errors that we talked before. Okay, so if the assumptions of the ANOVA are verified, we already have some information. We know, for example, that the groups are homeostasticity, and we know that the common variance is estimated by MSE. Okay, so we also know that if we're going to perform multiple tests, the probability of type error on each test is A, and we need to correct the alpha value to have the exact type 1 error probability. There are many different ways to adjust the alpha value of the pairwise comparisons. Uh, so <clears throat> two of the most common are the Bonferroni and the CDAC correction. Okay, so let's say that we decided to do K comparisons. We decided to do six, com uh, three comparisons. We're uh, on the on the wood on on the wood experiment. So we have four types of woods. We compare one of the types of the woods against the three others. So that's K comparisons. So our alpha adjusted would be the desired alpha divided by K. So if we're doing three comparisons and we wanted a 0 0.05 alpha, the alpha that we will actually use on our tests is 0 0.05 divided by three. This is the Bonferroni, this is the Bonferroni adjustment. The CDAC adjustment is a little bit different. It uses one minus one minus alpha family to one over K power. So in this case of um, alpha equal to 0 0.05, uh, we want to use with K equal to three, we're gonna use 0 0.95 to the, uh, the square, the, the cubic square, the, the cubic root of this one minus that, okay? There are other methods. These two are very conservative, which means that they are they protect the most against um, type one errors at the expense of being slightly less powerful, at the expense of having a higher probability of type two errors. So let's see the type of errors. We can, uh, the type of comparisons. We can do a all versus all comparison. So A versus B versus C versus D. B versus C versus D and C versus D, okay? So if we just want to know which levels are significant, different and which levels are not, we compare everyone against everyone. We don't have any extra information. In this case, the number of comparisons will be A times A minus one divided by two. So for the four types of papers, we're gonna have four times three, that's 12 divided by two, we're gonna have six comparisons, uh, which is, well, so we have six comparisons to compare all the types of woods in our previous example. Okay, so we're going to have sample size, the sample size calculations for this case follow the same rules for the t-test, uh, but with the alpha value corrected. Uh, we're going to go talk about this next, uh, next lecture. Okay. Uh, so for compare, performing all versus all multiple comparisons, a common alternative is to use the two key wholeness significance difference, the 8SD approach. So this method is generally chosen because it provides a slightly higher power than the Bonferroni correction. So a, sim a simple approach is to calculate the sample size using Bonferroni corrected alpha values for simplicity, and then performing the test using the two, two key uh, 8SD correction for the better power. So we have our number of samples to be n equals to two with the t adjusted divided by two plus t beta uh, times the uh, estimated uh, error divided by the desired difference. And this would be the number of uh, samples that we want for the all versus all comparison. So this would be the, uh, we can, one way to, uh, to program this, we can use on R, the multi-comp library. It implements the HSD. So first we get uh, the two key model for our, for, for our ANOVA model that we already calculated. And we say that our level is 0 0.95. This is the desired level. It will correct 
uh, for the desired level. And then we have the confidence intervals. And in this case, we have this middle line is the grand mean and the confidence intervals that do not touch the line are the ones that are significantly different from the uh, from the grand mean. So we can see that there is a difference on the, sorry, not the grand mean, the zero. So we can see that D and B are statistically different from each other, C and B are as well, and C and A are also uh, different from each other. So in comparison with the O versus O, we also have the O versus one. So comparison of O versus one happens when we have, for instance, one proposed approach versus a series of existing approach. So in our initial uh, suggestion is when we have a, our proposed approach versus the, a, a series of SOTA from the literature. Or when we have a comparison of different approaches versus a standard one or a, a placebo. We have a different uh, treatments and we want to compare all the treatments against a placebo to see which one performs best against the placebo. In all these cases, we have a smaller number of tests. The number of tests is K, which is A minus one, where A is the number of levels. So each test, again, can be done using the T-statistic. Now, <clears throat> when we're doing all versus one comparisons, there are two approaches that we can do. We can have a balanced design where all the, um, all the comparisons have the same number of um, samples, uh, same number of observations, and we can try to do an optimal allocation where um, we're trying to give more uh, observations for the tests that have higher variability. Okay, uh, I'm gonna skip this because this does not make a lot of sense without the, um, without the lecture on sample size, but go back to this slide after the next slide, uh, lecture to see how we can calculate uh, sample sizes for the balanced level and for the optimal location. One thing that is important is that there are softwares that can do the calculation of uh, sample, sample calculation for you. For instance, the G-Power 3, you can give it uh, your uh, estimated variance and the power and the, uh, and the difference that you are interested in and it will give you some uh, sample size calculations based on that. Finally, uh, we also have the Dunes test uh, for all versus one. Uh, <clears throat> so the Dunes test can be done for all, uh, all versus one comparison. So we decide the control group size sample N0 and we, we, uh, we compare all of them against this N0. So to do this on the, to do this on the on R, let's say that our base case is B. Okay, so B will be our standard level, and we want to compare everyone against B. So we can use this level to generate the B uh, the B levels from the <clears throat> from the data. Uh, we do the analysis of variance, and here we can use uh, the multi multi comparison package to do a done it uh, test on this model and you can see here the confidence intervals and you can see that a is not statistically significant from b but c and d are statistically significant from b notice that this test does not say anything about the comparison between c and d here so we cannot say if c and d are similar or not we just know the relationship of c and d to b so some final considerations this type of comparisons that are performed after ANOVA, they should be planned in advance. So just to remind, you should decide before you do the ANOVA, you should decide that are you going to, if the ANOVA rejects the new hypothesis, are you going to do an O versus O, an O versus one? And if you're going to do an O versus one, which is the one that you're comparing against? Is it a fixed value? Is it one of the groups? Okay. Um, and in general, you're gonna calculate the sample size, you use the sample size for the post hoc comparison. They are usually bigger than the sample size for the ANOVA. So you can, you can gather the data assuming that you're going to do the post hoc comparison anyway and use that data for the ANOVA in the beginning, okay? There are other approaches, we just covered two of them, O versus one and O versus wall, but uh, there are many more for specific cases. There is a link here for uh, a paper where you can have more information about that. Okay, 
uh, thank you very much for looking for this class. And next week, we're going to talk about how to calculate sample sizes for uh, tests on two samples and tests for multiple samples like ANOVA with some examples. See you there.